Welcome to Brave Healer Productions. We are waking the world up to what's possible for healing, one brave word at a time. Hey everyone, welcome to Brave Story Time. I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, and we're here today to help you experience what's possible. Brave Story Time is where our authors step up to share their wisdom from one of our expert collaborations. And I am thrilled to have Cheryl Kinney with me today to do just that. Well, welcome, Cheryl. How's it going? It's going great today, Laura. Good to see you. So you guys, Cheryl Kinney is a licensed clinical social worker, certified life coach, private therapist, and former instructor of university level classes on aging and dementia with over 35 years of experience guiding older adults and caregivers using a disease management approach. Cheryl contributed her beautiful chapter to our book, The Caregiver's Advocate, and this is by lead author Debbie Compton. Um, I honestly am so honored and grateful to be with you here today, Cheryl, and Debbie put together such a stellar cast of expert authors. You are one of them, and it's going to be so fun to hear you read your story today. So everybody... I want you to settle in, take a deep breath while Cheryl reads her chapter from The Caregiver's Advocate. All you, my dear. All right. My chapter is Building Your Support Team, The Art and Freedom of Asking for and Accepting Help. Why do those who give so much often have so much trouble asking for and accepting in help from others. That thought came to mind when Mary arrived for our dementia coaching session and burst into tears the moment the door to my office closed. Her hands shook as she described the daily struggle to take over things her husband Bill had always handled before Alzheimer's began robbing him of his memories and his ability to do even simple tasks at home. I knew that look of hopeless defeat in her tear-swollen, red-rimmed eyes after spending years guiding thousands just like her through the challenges of caregiving. Mary began telling me her story. I spent the last three days trying to balance the checkbook. Bill was an accountant, so he always handled all the money stuff. I never even looked at the bank statement. Last week, we got letters from the gas and water companies saying that they're going to cut off our service. He wasn't paying the bills. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like many care partners, Mary was suddenly faced with having to take on tasks she was unprepared to handle. And it wasn't just the household bill paying responsibility she now had to take over. Mary said he lost his driver's license after he had several accidents. Now he wants me to drive him to the golf course every day. It's winter. Nobody plays golf when it's snowing out. I don't even like to drive on a good weather day. Mary's hands were clenched tightly in her lap as though she had a steel grip on the steering wheel while trying to navigate through a snowstorm. In addition to taking on things at home that Bill always handled, she was now facing behaviors that further added to her stress. He gets up in the middle of the night and says he needs to get to work. He's been retired for 10 years. I have to beg him to go back to bed. He looks at me like he doesn't even know me. I thought to myself, it's obvious that Mary isn't getting enough sleep. He told me, last night the smoke alarm started going off at 3 a.m. and Bill just stared at it. I had no idea what to do. I finally just threw a shoe at it. I'm at my wit's end. Yep. Overwhelmed, exhausted, defeated. I didn't have to tell Mary that providing care and support can put a tremendous physical, financial, emotional, and spiritual toll on the caregiver. She was deep in the throes of it, and the circles under her red rimmed eyes made it obvious that she was stressed to the limit. And now her health was affected. Her doctor referred her to me because her blood pressure had reached a dangerously high level. I thought, she's so stressed 
doubt she's going to end up having a stroke if things don't improve soon. Then who's caring for Bill? As Mary's story unfolded, I learned more about her family and friends. She and Bill have a daughter and a son who live nearby. Bill has a group of guys he used to work with that he gets together with every week for coffee. Many of their neighbors and people from their church are considered their closest friends. When we began talking about which of these people she feels comfortable turning to for support, she responded with those words I've heard so often through the years. Oh, I would never ask for help. I don't want to be a burden. They have so much going on in their own lives. I thought I bet Mary would be the first person in line to help each of these people, but she can't bring herself to ask the same of them in return. I get it. I'm just like Mary. I've been there too. My husband, Jack, has received treatment for cancer off and on for the past 15 years. While he has responded well to the chemo, the side effects have been tough at times. I've felt the stress of trying to juggle work and home responsibilities while watching him grow so weak he could barely walk across the room. I've hidden my tears after coming home from work to find that he hadn't eaten all day. When he was in the hospital for five weeks for a stem cell transplant, he hated the hospital food. So after a long day of work, I would pick, pick up dinner from a local restaurant for the two of us to eat and then spend an hour or so with him. By the time I got home, all I wanted to do was crawl in bed. But there was a dog to walk and papers to grade for the class I was teaching. Fortunately, we've been blessed with plenty of offers for help, support, and prayers. People would say, let me know how I can help. Do you want me to take the dog for a walk? Can I bring Jack dinner so you can take the night off? I'd like to say I always accepted the offers of help, but honestly, I've been guilty of trying to convince myself that I'm strong and I'm able to handle anything that's put in on my plate. I've learned through experience that doing so only leads us down a very dark and lonely road. Because I have traveled a similar journey as Mary and many others like her, I've made it a personal mission to help the caregivers I work with accept that trying to do everything on our own isn't best for us or the person we're caring for. I gently told Mary the importance of taking care of herself so that she could be the best support possible for Bill. Mary, this is someone no this is something no one can or should do on their own. If you get sick, you won't be there for Bill. Let's talk about how you can begin to lighten your load. Together, we moved into the problem solving stage of our session by identifying her immediate needs, looking toward possible future needs, and then talking about how informal and formal support providers may meet, the, may meet these needs. We even role played how she might respond to offers from family and friends and how to overcome her reluctance to ask for help. I could see the tension slowly leaving Mary's body as she worked to create a plan for turning some of Bill's care and their household responsibilities over to others. Mary reached out to hug me as she left my office. Thank you so much. I can see now that I'm not alone. Now it's your turn. I'll teach you some simple steps to build your support team and increase your confidence in asking for and accepting help. Step one, learn to ask for and accept help. Learning to ask for and accept help is an art. And much like learning to paint and sculpt, you will feel more confident over time as you start practicing this art. Once you get the hang of it, you will feel a sense of freedom when you let go and let others share the responsibility of supporting the care receiver. The first step in building a support team is acknowledging that you need help. This is followed by giving yourself the freedom to ask for and accept that help. As humans, we're naturally wired to avoid appearing weak. Going back to the beginning of time, being weak made us vulnerable to injury, illness, and prey. But instead of ask, 
But instead of thinking that asking for help is a sign of weakness, think of it as a sign of strength. Seeking support is a proactive step we can take toward caring for ourselves and others. Helen Keller once said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. In the Christian faith and many other faiths, we're called to serve others. The Bible teaches us, teaches us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Therefore, when you allow someone else to give the gift of helping you in your time of need, you're allowing them to serve God. Scottish Arthur Alexander McCall Smith said it this way, gracious acceptance is an art, an art which most never bother to cultivate. We think that we have to learn to, how to give, but we forget about accepting things, which can be much harder than giving. Accepting another person's gift is allowing him to express his feelings for you. Think about how you may be keeping someone else from having the, the opportunity to spend time with the care receiver by not including them as part of that person's support team. Mary told me she didn't want to bother her son and daughter. They're so busy with their own lives. She said she would tell them everything was okay when they stopped or when they called or stopped by. She never mentioned how little sleep she was getting. She made up excuses when her son asked about the new dents in the fender of Bill's car. Mary told me how her daughter Karen had always idolized her dad and how she even became an accountant herself to follow in his footsteps. <clears throat> I don't wonder to see her dad this way. Sometimes he even forgets her name. I explained to Mary that because Bill has a progressive disease, there will come a time when he won't be able to talk to he won't be able to talk with Karen. <clears throat> but right now, it means a lot to him when she tells him how her new job is going. Suddenly, it became clear to her. I've been trying so hard to protect them from all of this that I've kept them from spending time with their dad. Receiving help reminds us that we're not alone but sometimes the help somebody offers isn't what we need at the time. Just like the neon colored fuzzy slippers your Aunt Mildred gave you for your birthday that were two sizes too small, some gifts aren't the right size or style for you. That's okay. If someone offers to help in a way that isn't needed at the time, don't decline the help. Instead, exchange it for something you do need. Mary started building her confidence in accepting help by turning an offer that didn't quite fit into something that would bring much needed relief. Bill's friend offered to stay with him so I could go out to lunch. I told him what would really help would be for him to bring Bill home after the men's coffee on Wednesdays. His friend was happy to do, to do this and offered to swing by to get Bill on the way to the coffee shop so Mary wouldn't have to drive it all on those days. Likewise, get in the habit of not accepting no for an answer. When Mary asked her son Brad if he would come over on Saturday to hang out with Bill so she could go to the store, Bill told her he had to take his daughter to her soccer match. Rather than accepting no, Mary practiced her newfound skill of asking for help. I started to ask him if he could pick up a few things for me from the grocery store on his way home from the game, but then I got the idea to ask him if he would take his dad with him to Maddie's game so I could go to the store by myself. Brad loved the idea. He couldn't wait to tell me how excited his dad got when Maddie waved to him from the field. He even got to see her score her first goal. Bill talked about that game for a whole week. It was a win for everyone. Step two, list current and future needs. It's best to have a mental list of things others can do to help so that you are ready when an offer is made. Better still, put it in writing. Start by drawing a line down the middle of a lined piece of paper. 
On the left side, write down all of the things you can think of that you could delegate to others. The sky is the limit here. There's no judgment. If you want to delegate cleaning the cat's litter box, write it down. If the need is urgent or time specific, include a note stating when the task needs to be done. Mary got her daughter and son to help start her list. The first draft included things she needed help with right away and some things she would need help with in the future. Her list, her list included rides to the men's coffee group, sign up for online bill paying, buy and install a new smoke alarm, this week, lawn mowing, spring and summer, get someone to file the taxes, April, research care options like in-home care, adult day services, and long-term care. Step three, identify informal and formal or professional support. On the right side of the paper, list all of the people and resources that could meet each need. If you can only think of one person or resource that can help, try to identify a backup if that person isn't available. First, list all potential informal support team members. This could include family, friends, neighbors, faith community members. You might feel more comfortable starting with those who have already offered to help in some way. Next, fill in the list with formal or professional support services like doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals, in-home care agencies and other formal care providers, nutrition, food, and meal services, area agencies on aging, even handyman services. Social workers and care managers can answer questions about care options and funding sources that may pay for care, such as Medicare, Medicaid, the Veterans Administration, and community grants. Voluntary health organizations, such as the Alzheimer's Association, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, and the American Cancer Society, can help caregivers know what to expect in the future. Many have online resources and toll-free helplines to answer questions and provide disease-specific information. Elder law attorneys can create necessary legal documents, such as a durable power of attorney and advanced directives. Financial advisors can assist in determining the funds that the care receiver has available to pay for the care that may be required and ways to avoid financial exploit exploitation. See chapter eight, the art of financial self-defense. Step four, fine tune your list. Think of the list you create as a work in progress. Your first draft will be messy. Take your time and add things as they come to mind. Ask others to help create the list. In other words, flex that new asking for help muscle. After you create as many needs and resources as possible, transfer the information to a more permanent document. Add to it and adjust the list as needs change. Overcoming Resistance and Managing Expectations. As mentioned before, the art of asking for help must be developed over time. Some caregivers have no trouble delegating responsibility. Others may, feel them, others may find themselves yes budding at the very thought. <clears throat> if you found yourself thinking of why you can't turn tasks and responsibilities over to others while reading this chapter, you're not alone. Here is how Mary responded when I introduced the idea of having a friend or an in-home companion stay with Bill so that she could go to the beauty shop once a week. Yes, but Bill would never agree to have somebody babysit him. I suggested that she ask her daughter or one of Bill's friends to take him to lunch on the day of her appointment. He'll Enjoy the outing, and you'll be glad not to have him tell you how to drive the whole way to your hair appointment. Sometimes just looking at the situation from another perspective will help you embrace the freedom of asking for and accepting help. It's important to consider who you can trust and rely on to help. 
This means managing your expectations. If you haven't had contact with your daughter for 10 years, it's best not to assume she will be there for you if you call. If your neighbor keeps telling you how busy they are when you ask for help, cross them off the list. One caregiver I worked with told me that her son made it clear to her that, that he was never going to change his dad's diapers. While this was hard for her to accept, she agreed it was better to know this up front so she wouldn't be disappointed if the situation ever arose. Instead, we talked about home care agencies that could assist as needed. After our consultation, she sat down with her son and they came up with other ways he could help, like running errands and mowing the grass. If you're struggling with the concept of sharing your care responsibilities, start by accepting a few offers or exchanging them for something that works best for you. Then ease into asking for a small favor. Consider talking to a social worker or therapist for help in working through the barriers to letting go. Remember, receiving help is a gift that you give to the person who helps you and a gift that you give to yourself. There is freedom in sharing the care you are providing with others. Know that you are not alone. Beautiful. Who would a topic? I'm going to rewind to your learn to ask for help. I wrote a few notes down, you guys. I can't help, I can't help myself here. The asking for help is a big one. I'm going to ask Cheryl about that in just a second. Exchange what's offered for something you do need. I, I don't know. I pulled that golden nugget out of there. I think we're afraid to do that. And her tool, her very simple tool of listing your needs first, like as an action step, you guys, right? So Cheryl, why do you think it's so hard for people to ask for help? <laughs> why is this so hard? Golden question. If I, I had that answer, life would be so easy. And we all do it, you know, like, oh, I can take, I can take care of this myself. I don't need help. There's some kind of a shame attached to it, I guess. And, or we think, you know, I can do that one more thing. And, and then that one thing adds on and adds on. And pretty soon we're doing all the things and it's hard. And that's why having the discussion is so important. And that's why when I work with people, I try to educate them about what to expect with the disease that they're managing and try to help them think ahead um, so that they're prepared. But writing out that list of things that they could use help with puts them in that position so that when an offer is made, they've got something to work with and they can exchange it if the offer isn't really what they need. I love that so much. All right. So I know this is a big question, but in, in the big theme of caregiving and really from your personal experience, like what's the most important thing you want people to know about this topic? Really, we need to understand that it's vital to take care of yourself. You can't be there for the other person if you're not well, and that's not well physically and emotionally and spiritually even. So if you're not taking that time to get some exercise or go to your own doctor's appointments or just get some sleep while maybe they're resting, um, you're not going to be in a position to help them. And um, so many caregivers I've talked to through the years have said, I know you say that all the time. Everybody's telling me I need to take care of myself, but, and we've got to help them get over the butt. You know, we've got to help them see that they just won't be there if they don't take care of themselves. So tell us now about your magic in the world. How do you help people? How do you work with people? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I have the honor of working with caregivers and people with early stage dementia and also individuals with Parkinson's through a private practice that I started in 2020, right in the middle of COVID. I had a 
loss of a long time career and I had to uh, come up with a new path. And so I decided to do that as a licensed clinical social worker. So I have a private practice and I also started a new business at the same time called Memory Keepers. And that's really my baby. I'm the co-founder of this program that provides socially engaging, cognitively stimulating interactions for people with mild to moderate dementia, which is also great for just older adults who want to stay cognitively fit. So my partner, Britt Lucan, and I started this business in 2020 as a virtual program that we offer once a week, and it grew and um, expanded, and we decided that we could and serve all the people who we think could benefit from this intervention. So we've packaged it into a subscription-based program that others can deliver. So it's actually something that care partners could do one-on-one -on -one with the person receiving care, but it could be delivered by licensed professionals. It could be delivered by volunteers. It can be offered in person or virtually. It could be offered one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting but it's based on a evidence-based intervention called cognitive stimulation therapy, which has been well-researched to um, improve, it improves mood, quality of life, and memory and thinking. Awesome. So memorykeepers.org, you guys, I've got Cheryl hooked up down below with everything, all the links and you can check out that program and reach out and ask her questions and all that good stuff. All right. So what are some last words for our listeners who might just be stepping out on this journey of healing and caregiving for the first time? What's, a, what's the last message you want to leave them with today? Early intervention and support is critical and doctors and other healthcare professionals should be guiding people through that. But if, even if they're not, if you're hearing this today, know that you really need to understand the person's disease or condition, if you're caring for somebody, you need to be knowledgeable about that and know where to get more information and what to expect. You need to, to learn about resources in your community, things that can help you care for that individual, and you need coping strategies, both for yourself and the person receiving care. So that's that managed care approach. And it should be very person-centered and personalized. It shouldn't be a cookie cutter approach. But if your healthcare practitioners are not offering that, then shame on them. But you should be asking for it. There are more and more resources out there for individuals that take that disease management approach. But I highly recommend it. And I think it will make the journey much easier. Mm, I love uh, that you're calling that out right now. All right, you guys, Ms. Cheryl just read her chapter three, building your support team, the art and freedom of asking for and accepting help from our book, The Caregiver's Advocate. Cheryl, thank you so much for what you do in the world. And thank you for being here today to share it with everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. So you guys, this is way more than a book. It is a generous community of expert authors who are waiting to answer the questions you have to grab your hand when you reach out for help, right? So drop down into the show notes. All of Cheryl's links are there for you. Check it out. Check out all the amazing things that she's up to. Reach out. She's ready to answer a question, help with some support, drive you in the right direction for resources, all of that good stuff. And thank you all for tuning in to this today. Please remember to give us a thumbs up and a subscribe below for more inspirational badassery from the Brave Healer community coming your way soon. And remember, you guys, your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it is time to be brave. See you next time, everyone.